Well, I'm going to tell you about uh, Axiom Space and uh, more generally what's happening in commercial space. But I realize that probably most people aren't space nerds like me, so I figured I'd give you a little context of what's happening in the world or in, uh, in, the, in space. So first of all, about 400 kilometer altitude, uh, the International Space Station is orbiting overhead. It's been up there for about 25 years. It's an amazing engineering achievement, uh, 15 countries involved, including a very tight relationship between the U.S. and the Russian. Uh, we cannot operate the International Space Station without both the U.S. and the Russian side, which has also been a demonstration of very peaceful cooperation over the years, uh, even through some hard times, including the ones we're in. Uh, we continue to operate very peacefully uh, together. For anyone that's 23 years old or younger in the room, there has never been a day in which humans haven't been in space. So for the last 23 years, we've had continuous human presence on the International Space Station. What's happening, though, uh, is that uh, the International Space Station is getting old, and, and also NASA is moving toward a different model where instead of owning the assets, they want to just rent the assets. And so they uh, offered an opportunity that uh, we competed for and won. And that opportunity is to build the new uh, space station, a commercial space station, and to build it uh, attached to the International Space Station for a while. And then at the end of the decade, we will separate and uh, NASA will very carefully put the International Space Station into the Pacific Ocean. A little fun fact for your cocktail party later. Uh, if the International Space Station was allowed to re-enter uh, uncontrolled, there's a 1 in 10 chance of killing someone on the Earth. So NASA has to be very, very careful in putting the International Space Station in the Pacific Ocean. So we're building a commercial space station. Uh, and as I said, we're going to build it uh, off of the International Space Station. Uh, our first module is being prepared uh, at Talasalenia in Italy, uh, the pressure vessel. It'll ship to Houston, Texas later this fall and we'll finish all the outfitting and then we'll ship it to the Kennedy Space Center where it will be integrated onto a SpaceX Falcon Heavy and launched to the International Space Station in 2026. Now, what does all that mean? The reason we're building the commercial space station and the reason NASA is interested, it's, it's very similar to how most of human history has evolved. Governments fund exploration and then after a time, there are intrepid pioneers that begin to settle places, and then that leads to settlers and the growth of civilization. Every great city, including the one we're in, uh, started around some natural resource, whether that was a river, a deep harbor, a uh, fertile plain, uh, natural crossroads of uh, trade. And the same thing is true in space. Low Earth orbit has a very unique resource. And that resource is microgravity, or the absence of gravity. And what it affords is the ability to make things that you can't otherwise make. 15 to 20 years from now, we'll be surrounded by objects that we can't imagine how we live without that were manufactured in space. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these early things that we're making in space. Um, that are really going to make life better for all of us. The key to a commercial space station is that when we discover something that's valuable to make, we can then make a million of them or a thousand kilograms of them. NASA can't do that. NASA can do the research and experiment, but they don't have the charter to then commercialize it. So having a commercial space station will be able to do that. So I'm going to show you some things that we've been doing. So leading up to our, our module being on orbit, uh, we've been flying private astronaut missions. So we've flown three, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. And on those three missions, we've uh, done a tremendous amount of research and technology development. I'm going to show you just a few of those uh, to get your uh, interest in uh, the future of, uh, of uh, the space economy. So we should have some slides. That's a rendering of our space station. Um, again, we will build about four modules attached to the ISS, and then by the end of the decade, we will separate. NASA disposes of the ISS, and then we continue to uh, be on orbit. Um, we have a modular design that allows us to add modules over time. 
We're already in discussions with countries who want to have their own module, uh, and we think in the future companies will have their own module to manufacture the thing that they've discovered to manufacture. Another interesting thing that we're building is the Earth Observatory uh, below. It's the largest space window ever attempted. Uh, it has actually no engineering or scientific purpose, but it'll be where all the Instagram pictures are taken. Uh, amazing view of the Earth. One of the interesting things about the International Space Station is the crew uh, spends at least one meal a day together. Uh, no matter what they're working on, they all get together and spend at least one meal uh, together. Uh, we think the Earth Observatory would be a great place to have lunch. So as I said, we've flown three missions. Uh, the first one was all high wealth individuals. Um, but they all had very um, specific philanthropic and research activities. Uh, one gentleman was tied to the Montreal Children's Hospital, so he did some fundamental uh, cancer research. Another gentleman tied to the Cleveland Clinic. So they all did a tremendous amount of uh, research and technology development. Many things leading, we hope, very soon to innovative treatments, and I'll talk some about that as we go. The second mission, uh, we had one high wealth individual and then two uh, national astronauts from Saudi Arabia, including a woman, which as a country was pretty remarkable um, and very much a cultural statement for the country. Uh, they want to have more women in the workforce. They want to stimulate um, science and technology, engineering and math in the country. So space was a very uh, important way for them to do that. Um, and Saudi Arabia also represents a country that wants to be a spacefaring nation. The International Space Station has 15 member countries, and so those 15 member countries are the ones that get to participate in the ISS. Uh, that leaves a whole lot of other countries that have not had the chance to participate, and so Saudis very much have a, a national uh, imperative to be a spacefaring nation. And then the third mission that we flew more, most recently uh, was all country astronauts. So a uh, gentleman from uh, the Italian Air Force, Walter Villaday. Uh, we had a Swedish astronaut that was sponsored by the European Space Agency. That one is particularly interesting in that uh, it was the first time a space agency entrusted their astronaut with a private company. And then we flew uh, an astronaut from uh, Turkey, which was the first astronaut from that country. And again, the power of space has this effect of uh, really having a huge influence on the culture. Uh, Alper would tell stories that when he was a boy, he couldn't imagine going to space because no one in his country had ever done so. Uh, now that's very different. There's lots of kids in Turkey that want to go to space, they want to become engineers and scientists, so it's a powerful influence for the country. I'm not going to read through all these, but I'm just going to give you a smattering, uh, and I'll tell you some of my favorites. So. All three missions, we've flown experiments from UC San Diego's Stem Cell uh, Research um, Institute. They actually have a very large endowment, $140 million endowment, just to study stem cells in microgravity. And for reasons uh, I certainly can't explain, and I'm not sure we fully know, that uh, stem cells grow much more rapidly in space, and they grow very differently. And so what that's allowed UC San Diego to do is to very, very quickly, in a very accelerated way, do drug discovery. Uh, in a week's time on space, they can do drug discovery that would take a year on the ground. The other thing that they're discovering is uh, the ability to make things that you can't make on the ground. And uh, one of those is a cartilage replacement treatment uh, that we think will be commercial very soon. Another experiment we did is on uh, essentially 3D printing organs. So it's been attempted on Earth, and we actually 3D print uh, skin cells and, and, and very thin layer things on Earth. But if you try to print an entire organ on Earth, it's sort of like trying to make a sandcastle with dry sand, and it just slumps. But in microgravity, you can print an entire organ, including all the vascularization. So we did a few demonstrations of that. So imagine sometime in the future, um, you need a heart transplant, you send your DNA to a space station, your heart is 3D printed and then returned and put inside you. 
uh, some amazing capability. We're also looking at materials. Uh, some, uh, we did an experiment on sort of self-assembly of, um, of machines in space. And then another uh, experiment is that in microgravity, you can make an alloy that can be twice as strong as the same alloy on the Earth. And it's because the molecules all align how they want to as opposed to stratifying. So we think there's obviously some very interesting applications there. So this is just a smattering of the things that are possible. I also believe that when there's a commercial space station, there'll be lots more entrepreneurs that have ideas that uh, will lead to products being made uh, in space. Primarily because if you have an idea now and you fly it on the International Space Station, you can prove the concept, but then NASA can't help you make a thousand of them or a million of them or a thousand kilograms of them. covered some of these. I think at that point, uh, we're going to have a little q and I'm going to be. Thank you so much, Matt. Round sure. of applause. Um, I can already feel the cogs turning and the minds of the entrepreneurs in the room, and I'm sure that there are so many more questions. And so I would like to invite to the stage TechU's very own journalist to uh, ask uh, Matt even more questions. So uh, Lucy Adams, please. <laughs> Matt, thank you. It's such an honor to have you here today. Welcome to the London Tech thank EU Summit. Um, we're going to jump straight in, if that's OK, because there's so much get to get through, and we have a really short session. So firstly, what I want to know is, you've now sent three human manned space, space flights from Axiom into low orbit on, in the past three years alone. Um, it's such a phenomenal undertaking, and it's such a phenomenal achievement, and those flights have included crew members from eight countries. How are you working with governments all over the world to, to make it happen? Yeah. Uh, so it's been um, quite a, a trip, or quite, a, quite a journey. I think uh, the first mission was probably really only possible with high wealth individuals. Um, hard for a country to commit some of their national treasure to some startup company and they're going to do what now? Uh, so I think proving that we had the capability to put humans uh, at the International Space Station was an important first step. And now what's really emerging is that um, countries see the power of being in space for a number of reasons. One, uh, as I mentioned, stimulating STEM in the country. Uh, providing some national prestige uh, for the country and to be seen as a technological leader. And finally, they want to be part of this new space economy. They, many countries see the future of making things in space and, and uh, they want to be part of that. What challenges do you see there that you have to kind of work with them to overcome? Because I imagine there are many different systems from different countries? Yeah, I think the, the main challenge uh, with countries is it's a, something different. And uh, things that are different and unusual take a little time to get traction and to get um, countries that, uh, to set aside the budget for it and to understand what they can do in it. We do spend a lot of time working with countries to help them understand the possibilities of the things they can do. And some of the research that I described, we actually helped develop for the countries. Um, but it's really been uh, very, very positive and I think only going to grow. Uh, in fact, in the UK, um, the UK Space Agency would like to do an all UK mission. So all country, all, uh, all four astronauts from the UK and that would be really, really amazing. So we're working with the UK Space Agency and then a number of UK companies that can uh, try to help them understand what they can do in space. I think all of us here today are particularly excited about the UK's future as, as an innovation and, and tech superpower because it looks like, like that whole movement is really snowballing. Mm -hmm. So what more can you tell us about the UK, the all UK manned flight into low orbit and how, how you're making that happen behind the scenes? Yeah. So uh, part of the reason I, I, I'm here is to, to help uh, further those conversations. Um, we hope it's on what we, we name the missions AX1, 2, 3, etc. Uh, AX4 will fly next spring and we have the crew uh, 
mostly identified for that in the countries that are involved in that. I can't formally announce all of them yet, but Poland is one that's uh, represented by uh, the, um, the European Space Agency. So it's probably on AX5 or AX6 that we hope is this all UK mission. And so we're really just uh, building the momentum, getting the funding for it, getting the co uh, companies that are interested in, in participating. The other interesting thing that I hadn't talked about, um, there are opportunities outside of the technology development and research. There are opportunities in brand management and, and flying things. We have a relationship with uh, Build-A-Bear. Uh, if you're familiar, we fly this little Build-A-Bear called Gigi, uh, who is our um, zero-G indicator. So when you get into orbit, they release the little bear and it floats around to prove that you're in microgravity. So we have all those kind of relationships too that we can do and help promote. We have a relationship with Omega Watches and, and uh, those kind of uh, branding opportunities also that are very interesting. I want to say one more thing. Uh, Axiom Space, we also won the opportunity to build the next generation spacesuit uh, for NASA. And uh, it's a similar model where we will own the spacesuit and NASA will buy the service. Uh, and so with that, we can put certain branding elements uh, on the spacesuit. You may have heard we have a partnership with Prada for that. Uh, but also imagine that the sole of the boot can have uh, really any emblem or logo on it. And that footprint in the moon will last 10 million years. So that's quite a branding opportunity. And uh, so those are the kind of things that we can do as a commercial space uh, station. How important are public-private partnerships in this space. It does seem like it's something, like something that everyone needs to be on board with. Um, what does each party bring to that, that partnership? Yeah, and, and you know, building a space station is, is a partnership with NASA. So uh, again, NASA's not paying to build a space station, but they're, they're funding the partial development. So very similar to how they uh, supported SpaceX and Boeing and Sierra Nevada to build launch capability. Uh, they're doing the same for us. In the end, though, the funding from NASA will be about 5% of what we need to build the space station. So the rest we're, we're raising uh, through private equity. Um, and so that partnership is a nice leverage in that investors see that there's a future customer in NASA and ESA or Japanese Space Agency. So when they see that the government is interested, it, it helps de-risk some of the investment. And then from the government standpoint, they'd much rather have it mostly paid for by private venture, and so it's an advantage to the government as well. So there's a kind of a mutual um, advantage to both. We are really low on time, but yeah. I'd love to ask one more thing, if I may. Um, given the kind of the extensive experience that you have in this field. What lessons were you able to bring from your time at NASA and, and into your work at Axiom? Yeah, so part of, uh, so I spent 28 years at the Johnson Space Center, which is for NASA, the home of human spaceflight. And so participated in the building of the ISS. Most of the ISS, the technology is from the 90s or early 2000s. Um, so some of the, advantages to now are just simply advances in technology. For example, our computer uh, system, the one that's on the ISS is a million dollar custom Honeywell box. Today though, uh, we're using mostly automotive parts. A modern automobile has 60 million lines of software code running and it's taken in GPS and radar data and very, very capable. So our flight computer now is going to be a $10,000 machine with radiation hardening. So those are just some of the you know, examples of advances in technology. And then the others are just lessons learned on how we operated it. Um, one thing on the ISS that is really difficult to manage is the trash. And it's because we didn't really think about how much trash we generate. Um, and so we've been more thoughtful about those sort of things and, and how do we manage that. That's incredibly interesting. Matt, thank you so much for our time. Thank you. Thank you.